from the world of post-apocalyptic science fiction to the works of noted psychics such as Nostradamus, most belief systems outside of Christianity, and some even within the church, speculate as to what great disaster will start off the end of the world. This is the one thing the Bible does not tell us. Whether it's nuclear war or an asteroid hitting the earth, what really matters is how people will react afterward. Millions today who would never set foot in a church will cry out to God like never before as the world secular humanism has tried to build for 250 years finally collapses. And this is where knowing Bible prophecy in the light of the three-way conflict we've been discussing is so important. Because there will not just be one revival within the church, there will be two. A true revival and a false revival, a counterfeit. By understanding the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, you will be able to tell the difference. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. There is a word theologians use to describe many Bible passages, chiasm, which refers to a text that begins and ends the same way. What's described in verse 6 as the everlasting gospel is repeated in verse 12 with, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The everlasting gospel is the way the Old Testament should have been understood. The gospel of born-again faith in the Messiah and all ten of the Ten Commandments. It's practical Christianity. Our Heavenly Father's purpose in giving Jesus to humanity was and is not just a way to save us from sin as individuals. It's also a way to recreate the earth as the home for the saved ones who love him and restore this planet to the place in his universe it was originally supposed to have. When the Holy Spirit sends a message to people and it is rejected, it takes a stronger message to get their attention again. While the majority within the world reject the gospel itself, the majority within the church also reject it by stopping at some point along the road to perfection. This is either because some detailed application of the true gospel points out cherished sins, or the people in question have unknowingly mixed in cultural interpretations with their faith, which are now exposed. And the essence of the conflict between good and bad religion is on self-righteousness versus true righteousness by faith. There are three messages, each stronger than the previous, because there are also three levels of rejection people go through. Each message answers a question raised in the heart of someone who is searching for truth, but uncomfortable with the truth at the same time. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Another way to describe true righteousness by faith is to see the Ten Commandments as God's way of saying, this is how I want you to love me, and this is how I want you to love each other. They were not done away like all the various ceremonial regulations of the Old Testament. Themselves, being symbolic lessons of the cross and the plan of salvation. God's holy law is as eternal as he is and should be rightly thought of as a guide to life. Discipleship, Christ-likeness of character, Jesus is the goal in getting to heaven. 
The Ten Commandments are the guardrails on either side to prevent you from falling away. When one comes to understand this, the question should naturally arise as to why the Sabbath was changed. The answer is, it never was. If this is not an answer someone likes, he or she will respond by saying, What does it matter which day I keep? While the question may seem logical, it is actually a rejection of God's law. The Sabbath was with us at the creation of this planet, confirmed again at Mount Sinai, and repeated a thousand years later when the Jews returned from their Babylonian captivity. It was kept by Jesus during his whole earthly life, and also by Paul and the early church. That Isaiah 66 says, In eternity all flesh will worship him on the Sabbath, shows it's not just us, but his entire perfect universe, the angels and hosts alongside those who are saved from this world. If, after having accepted Jesus as your Savior, you keep his holy day the way he wants you to, no amount of science will ever again be able to prove evolution to you. You will know by a supernatural connection with him that he created the world the same way he created you into a new person. As we are now living in this end time judgment, it is time for a serious commitment to Christ, which includes worshiping him. The Lord is calling for a reform among those who call themselves his people by responding to this question with, keep the Sabbath. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The second message now takes the differences in Christian faith quite a bit further in answer to the next level of rejection. If someone's heart is still not subdued, they will respond with, but I like my church. My church, my faith, my philosophy, my religion, my belief system, my truth. All these phrases have one thing in common. They're all ways of saying what I believe in is nothing more than an extension of myself. God reveals truth. His truth is the only truth that can set you free. We need a humble, teachable spirit in order to truly connect with Him. This thought may seem innocent enough at first, especially if someone can find real examples of the Lord's obvious leading in their lives before they've ever known anything about the Sabbath question. God was with them then. They were not wrong to see Him there. But the Lord is now leading them further by offering them a new way to experience Him as a Sabbath keeper. However, the idea of my truth equates to the same self-exaltation Adam and Eve manifested when they ate that piece of fruit. And what is Babylon here? For that, we have to skim a lot of Bible history. When the Lord called Abraham into the Promised Land, he gave him a political promise for this life and a spiritual promise for the next. The political promise was briefly achieved under David, but was thrown away by Solomon. It was permanently removed at the Babylonian captivity, never to return. Jesus, in coming to the earth, fulfilled only the spiritual promise, which he gave to all people through the church, not just the Jews. This is shown in John 18, 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. 
the political promise was left in the hands of the various nations of Daniel 2 as they rose and fell. As mentioned in video 2, when the West extended itself out to the rest of the world, the church followed along. Daniel chapters 7 and 8 also repeat the rising and falling nation storyline, while adding a very important detail of one more kingdom, the little horn, known today as the Vatican. Once Constantine legalized the church, a slow spiral began toward a union of church and state not supported by God or Scripture. Political Rome was replaced by spiritual Rome. This is what the focus of Revelation is. In chapters 17 and 18, we have a woman riding a beast. The woman symbolized the church. The beast symbolized civil government. However, the pure woman of Revelation 12 stands on the moon, a reflector of the sun, and Jesus is the son of righteousness. As we said in video 6, only the religious aspects of the Reformation are important for the last days. In the Apostles' Creed, the phrase, Holy Catholic Church, is used. Catholic meaning universal. It's common knowledge that as the Church spread and encountered various pagan belief systems, they were incorporated into a hybrid faith their demigods being repackaged as saints who were celebrated in a liturgical calendar that had no basis in the Word of God. Here's how it's put in Fox's Christian Martyrs of the World. By reading this history, a person should be able to see that the religion of Christ, meant to be spirit and truth, had been turned into nothing but outward observances ceremonies, and idolatry. We had so many saints, so many gods, so many monasteries, so many pilgrimages. We had too many churches, too many relics, true and fake, too many untruthful miracles. Instead of worshiping the only living Lord, we worshiped dead bones. In place of immortal Christ, we worshiped mortal bread. While Protestants for the most part still keep Christmas and Easter, rejecting the rest, even these are known to have originally been sun worship holidays. All the descent into the intellectual and political darkness of the Dark Ages started with the spiritual compromises we've been discussing. And the first compromises were the changing of the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first, and the adoption of Greek ideas on death and hell. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The third level of rejection is basically some form of saying, If they won't change, will make them change, referring to the fact that Christianity no longer rules the West, and through these one-issue groups, secularism has taken over. As terribly evil as things like abortion and gay marriage really are, God wants to melt people's hearts with his love and win them. It's for this reason Jesus was so nice to tax collectors and prostitutes, and was so hard on the religious leaders of his day. God's mercy does not imply support for sin. Remember the story of the prodigal son. What the Lord really wants is to have people back, but he will not compromise himself to get them. All who want to try the way of this world can have a chance, but they will each, as individuals, be brought to a point where they feel a hollow emptiness within their hearts because this world cannot fulfill you. If they will come back to him by repentance, our Heavenly Father, through Jesus, will forgive and restore them. 
The son who stayed with his father showed an unrighteous character by the contempt he had for his brother when his brother was returning. This same contempt is manifested when Christians think that by taking control of the government and making society Christian again, they can save the world. Another example of this is in the assassination of Gedaliah, the man appointed by the Babylonians as governor after they had destroyed Jerusalem. Ishmael thought he was a believer in God. However, he proved he was a believer in name only when he killed not only his political enemy, representing those outside the faith, but also his fellow believers who had no political interest, who were only there to worship. This process will be repeated today as the contempt for those who reject God completely will lead false believers to persecute true believers, just as Jesus predicted. Remember Matthew 24, 14, in saying the gospel will be preached in all the world, immediately follows verse 12, which says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And over the centuries, what has been the one way in which bad religion has tried to flex its muscle in society? Sunday laws. Many sincere people in all denominations worship on Sunday. As long as we have religious freedom, we will not have the mark of the beast. But when Sunday is forced on the world by law, it will then be the mark. During the Reformation, Protestants pointed to Daniel 7 and 8 to say the Pope was the Antichrist and the Catholic Church was the beast. But we have the beast and the image of the beast in Revelation 13. The Catholic Church was the beast during the Dark Ages. But today, anyone who acts like the Catholics did back then will be the image. This is especially prevalent in American evangelical Christianity. In every age of religious persecution, the process has been the same. Whether it was Christians being fed to the lions in the Roman Colosseum, or a heretic being burnt at the stake in some medieval town square, all those in the crowd who felt sorry for the martyr would have felt sorry for Jesus had they been in the crowd watching him die. This is evidence that God is at work in those individuals' lives, even though to outward appearances they may not seem like they are all that spiritual. Today we are going to see this same process on a grand worldwide scale. This conflict will divide the Christian church into camps that go beyond denominational boundaries. One will try to conquer the world by killing for Sunday. The other will try to win the world by their willingness to die for the Sabbath. A Sunday law may seem like the perfect way to take society back to the days before abortion, gay marriage, and pornography. It may seem like a way to restore the sense of community people once had that we've now lost in this interconnected world we live in. In reality, it will be a way to take the world back to a time in which it was supposedly less sinful than it is now. However, what God will be doing through his true revival will be offering people a chance to go on to the perfect world as this world is now ending. If time continued, and every prophecy of the Bible came to pass except for the actual second coming, we would end up with an updated version of the Dark Ages. A union of church and state with a new one-world religion would be formed. The Pope would be its head, and Saint Buddha, Saint Mohammed, and Saint Billy Graham would be underneath him. Papal bulls, would be enforced by the combined military, cultural, and economic power of the United States, courtesy of a unified evangelical church. The big difference is that this time, there would be no wilderness for people to hide in like there was for true believers centuries ago. 
Satan would succeed in wiping God's people from the face of the earth, and he would have total control here. What the devil has always wanted is worship. So Christ has to come back, save us, and put an end to this great controversy that has raged on for 6,000 years. I've spoken in public meetings, teaching these messages, and I have shared them in one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. I've seen this three-level rejection dynamic time and time again. When the issue of the Sabbath versus Sunday becomes that plain and clear, all those in the rest of the world's belief systems who watch on the sidelines, including the evolution-believing science and science fiction fan communities, will all make their choice for one side or the other. But you can make that choice now before all this happens, and it will happen. Jesus died for you. He wants you to be with him forever in the new earth he is going to create. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look and it will be their study throughout endless ages. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. Desire of Ages, page 19. In the evening sunset when the sky slowly changed God just wants to remind you He was with you throughout the day And the next morning When the sun comes up again That's God's way of saying I am always by your side Evergreen, evergreen His love is an end Love is never fading for you and me. Evergreen, evergreen, just take a minute to look all the way you says I love you. If you're ever troubled or wonder if someone cares. Remember all the beautiful flowers God for you prepared You can see His love in the season Well, He loves you for no reason He may send the lightning and rain But the sun will always shine again Evergreen, evergreen Fading for you and me. Evergreen.